All right. Uh, good morning, still, I guess. Time zone appropriate greeting here. Um, here to talk a little bit about CloudStack and uh, Ceph's RBD. Um, to do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of an architecture overview of what Ceph is, kind of how it works, how it fits together. Uh, and then at the end, I can show you how it plugs into CloudStack. Seems how we had such a great CloudStack introduction here uh, just a minute ago. <coughs> so, without further ado, we'll get started and we'll talk about Ceph first. A um, little bit about Ceph, why you should care uh, about yet another distributed storage platform. Um, the, the big three, obviously, are time, cost, and requirements, right? So Ceph does things uh, a little bit differently in a number of different ways. Um, the first thing that we kind of wanted to take a, a crack at is time, right? And especially with the number of challenges being thrown at any given DevOps person, uh, your time is extremely valuable. Uh, so we wanted Ceph to be incredibly easy to administer. Um, and this includes especially like uh, some of the problems that you've seen managing uh, data clusters of various flavors. Um, sometimes there involves a lot of uh, manual data migration, load balancing, a lot of attention. They're like uh, very small children sometimes and you kind of need to give them a lot of attention. Uh, we wanted to kind of make Ceph more of, uh, of an adult or at least an adolescent. Uh, so it doesn't need quite as much of your time. Um, and along with that also is painless scaling, right? Scaling up and scaling down. Uh, we realize that, you know, storage needs change, um, your locations change, how you're handling your data, uh, you know, anything is up, uh, wide open for change. Um, so we wanted to be able to scale the storage system out to meet your needs uh, dynamically, uh, so you wouldn't have to kind of shut it down. Uh, you could just kind of plug and play and the, the cluster would rebalance and kind of adapt to whatever it was that you uh, needed it to do. Um, of course, the, the, the big numbers in everybody's eyes is cost, right? Um, you want your storage to be a very kind of linear or as close to linear as you can get it, a uh, function of size and performance uh, to how much money you're pouring into in your given setup. Um, and the nice thing about Ceph is uh, it's designed to run on commodity hardware, um, you know, rather than kind of these forklift upgrades. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more about kind of the architecture, but um, cost was a big feature for us, right? We wanted it to be open source. We wanted it to stay open source. Uh, and in doing so, um, Sage Weil, the founder, uh, created not only is it kind of this copyleft license, you know, it's the LGPL2, but uh, also any contributor to the project owns their own contributions. So no matter what happens, um, nobody, no corporate entity is going to be able to, to close Ceph down and, and charge crazy amounts of money for it. So, um, you know, you're not going to get that vendor lock in uh, and you'll be able to keep doing that uh, linear progression. So you want, you want another host, you want another uh, 10 terabytes, you want another 10 petabytes, it doesn't matter. Uh, you just load in whatever you want, um, drop Ceph on it, and you're off to the races. And of course, uh, the requirements, because you know, people, when they talk about storage, they can mean any one of a number of things, because um, there's huge diverse storage requirements across the industry. Um, whether it be, you know, I just want an object store to drop a bunch of things into, uh, whether I want, you know, block storage, which we're going to probably talk a little bit more about today than anything else. Um, primary use case, obviously, being VMs, right? You want a place to, to back your VMs or, you know, maybe you want some disks that you can mount somewhere. Um, or, you know, maybe your other option that you want is the, uh, a shared file system with POSIX compliance that you can actually ha uh, use across distributed hosts. Um, in any case, you know, you're going to want to have uh, a number of different ways to handle your data, uh, and there were a lot of different and kind of sometimes difficult problems that we kind of had to solve. Um, and obviously, one of the biggest requirements out of any of them is going to be scale, right? Um, People want to start small, typically, um, small being a relative term depending on your organization and your use case. Uh, but you want to start small, uh, make sure everything's working, you get all the, the kinks ironed out of your system, uh, and then you want the ability to scale that same system uh, to, you know, I infinity with a little asterisk next to infinity. Um, and so the, the, re the way we wanted to scale uh, was with that heterogeneous hardware, right? So. Uh, kind of some of the enterprise storage stuff of the past. Uh, it's been, you know, I want a petabyte, I go to storage vendor X, they send me one, I forklift it in, and if I want another petabyte, uh, it's another forklift, uh, either to replace the previous one or another forklift for the exact same, which I'm gonna spend, you know, N dollars times two on for the next one. Um, 
so we wanted to make it a lot easier. You know, you plug and play uh, down to the disk level uh, rather than the giant racks or data centers. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we want a lot more reliability and fault tolerance. Because we're moving to this kind of heterogeneous hardware setup, you know, this commodity hardware, um, you have to expect that at any given time, you know, maybe 10% of your hardware is going to be on fire. Uh, so you, you kind of have to plan your fault tolerance a little bit differently um, than something else uh, that may be uh, all of kind of a big giant black box. So what is Ceph? Uh, Ceph is a, a distributed, it's a unified storage platform, um, and it does primarily three things, right? We do object, block, and file storage. Um, you know, the object, uh, typically we'd say it's an object store, you can treat it w with the native interfaces, um, but we also have a RESTful interface that you can get at it. I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, we have a block device. You can do, it's a thinly provisioned block device on top of your object store. Um, you can do things like, you know, snapshots, cloning, uh, your typical, you know, mount and use it as a disk. Um, and then we also have a file store on top of the uh, distributed object store, which gives you thing, you know, strong consistency. You can do snapshots in your file system, all kinds of stuff. Um, so what does it look like? It looks like this. So at the, at the heart of it all, Ceph is a distributed object store, right? It's Rados. Uh, it's a, a very reliable, autonomic, distributed object. Uh, it's sort of comprised of kind of these, uh, a lot of self-healing, self-managing intelligent storage units, right? And you can see that if you can read the slides. Um, but so at the base of it, it's this object store. And on top of that, we give you a number of different ways to talk to it, to interact with it. Um, and you'll see, obviously, uh, the block and file is here, but that's not all we do, uh, right? So let me step back and we'll talk about um, the object for a minute. So why do we start with object? Um, you know, you can ask a million different people and you'll probably get a million different answers. But the, the biggest thing is um, w when we started looking at what do we want to put as the underlying technology, right? Some people started with, with block devices and they kind of aggregate block devices and do crazy things. But we wanted objects because it seemed to us that it was more useful. Um, it gives you names in a single flat namespace. Um, you can have wildly variable size. Um, and it gives you a very simple API with relatively rich semantics uh, that you can work with from the very b uh, base level building block of what you're working with. Um, we also found it to be you know, more scalable than individual files, um, so you don't have to deal with that kind of uh, hard to distribute hierarchy. Uh, you don't have to worry about how your objects are spanning across multiple different blocks and things like that. Um, and uh, the, the workload is, is very trivially parallel uh, when you get into specific use cases. Uh, and so Ceph's object model, uh, we have a number of pools uh, that we distribute. Uh, so you'll, you'll define a pool. Uh, you can have you know, a single pool up to hundreds of pools uh, in your Ceph cluster. Um, independent namespaces or object collections um, on those pools. Um, you can actually define rules of how you want your data placement, your data storage to go. Um, based on individually on those pools. So you can say you have one pool that says I want three copies of everything in this pool versus another that I want, you know, ten copies of everything in this pool. Um, and then uh, in those pools we have uh, objects, obviously, which huge metric piles of data. Um, you have the, the actual data itself, you know, in these ob objects you can have blobs of data, which is, you know, bytes to gigabytes in size. Uh, you can have the attributes uh, assigned to those, um, you know, bytes to kilobytes kind of thing. Uh, and then you can also store the key value bundles in there. Um, let me skip forward a little. So usually when you have a system, uh, we'll get into the architecture a little bit here. Uh, you have a given system, right? It's a human talking to the computer um, that has any number of, of disks, whether it's spinning rust or SSD or whatever. Um, so it looks like this, well, a little bit more like this, right? So you usually have huge numbers of people trying to get at your data that's sitting on your disks. Uh, and so that computer very quickly becomes uh, a bottleneck. And so Ceph kind of does it a little bit differently. Uh, we aggregate a whole bunch of different machines uh, and we just treat it as a, a, a big pile. Um, I had to explain it to someone very non-technical the other day and I, I said it was, it was like there was a pretty girl at the dance and there's uh, a, a thousand guys like me who all want to dance with her and so we made her arbitrarily large so that everyone could dance with her at once. Um, they, they didn't think that was a terribly good uh, <laughs> uh, way to, to simplify it, but uh, in a sense that's what, what we're doing is we're making it, really we're making a, a thousand copies of her, perhaps, would be a better way to say it. Um, 
So in, in your storage cluster, you have uh, a large number, you know, tens to tens to thousands of these object storage daemons, uh, right? Typically, we will run the object storage daemon one per disk, uh, whether, and that's, you know, the heterogeneous hardware thing, whether that's uh, an SSD or, you know, just a typical SATA drive or a RAID configuration of some sort. Um, you, you drop your OSD down on top of that. Um, and those are the things that are actually doing the, the serving of stored objects to your clients, right? The, and uh, they do a lot of things. There's some intelligence that's been built into them. Um, so rather than having, uh, and we can get into the, the lookups and stuff later, but um, rather than having to worry about, you know, going through a single controller, you're getting your clients that are eventually, you know, as the air traffic controllers, which are the monitors I'll talk about in a second, um, they'll tell you where to hit your data, and you'll go directly to that OSD, uh, and then the OSD will intelligently kind of peer with the rest of the cluster um, to worry about things like uh, data replication, uh, data recovery, when another OSD goes down. Uh, they're always talking to each other. Um, can get a little chatty, uh, but the OSDs tend to have a, a certain amount of intelligence built into them uh, so that you don't have to worry about um, always having traffic come off your cluster to do things and go back. Uh, there's a lot of inter-cluster uh, discussion, if you will. Um, and then you also have these monitor nodes, typically a small, odd number of monitors. Um, three or five is usually what we're seeing in, uh, you know, early production clusters. Um, these guys are the air traffic controllers. Um, they're the ones that are maintaining the cluster state, uh, authentication. Um, they're the ones that are providing consensus for these kind of distributed decision making. Um, they aren't actually involved in the data path. Uh, so they're the kind of ones that tell everyone where to go and, and how things are, are, what the current state of the cluster is. Uh, so if you look a little closer, it kind of looks like this, right? So the OSD nodes typically will be more than just a single disk and a single OSD. You'll have a machine that's running, um, and those will actually have disks underneath them, and you'll have some sort of file system on top of them. Um, we think the future uh, should probably be ButterFS. That's where we'd like to be. Um, there are some performance concerns and stuff that, that it isn't quite there yet. Uh, most people are using like XFS or you know X4 is another good option. Um, but you have some file system sitting on top of your disk, and then you drop your OSD on top of it. Um, and you know you maybe we're seeing like anywhere from four to twelve disks uh, in a machine uh, for a single uh, node, uh, and then kind of all of those you have many nodes that are put together uh, to form your cluster. So what makes Ceph cool? Well, the, the one thing for me that was uh, interesting and continues to be interesting as both uh, a piece of technology as well as an academic uh, interesting pursuit is Crush. Crush is kind of at the heart of what makes Ceph powerful. Uh, it's a pseudo-random placement algorithm. It's a controlled replication under scaled hashing. Um, this is what allows Ceph to be really fast when it comes to uh, things like uh, lookup or you know data placement, data re uh, retrieval, and things like that. Um, so historically, you had things like uh, a single node lookup, right? You had to, if you wanted some data and you had it somewhere, you had to do one of a couple of things, right? You had to kind of make a, a logical distribution of where your data is, kind of the phone book approach, right? A to A to C is on this one, and and you know X to Z is on this one over here, and and I'd know where to kind of go after it, um, or you could say, I have a bunch of data over here, and when I want to find out where it is, I'm going to write down in some lookup table where it is. And so you have to go to the lookup table, find out where it is, and go find it. With Crush, it kind of removes that whole step. Um, Crush uh, allows you to repeatedly calculate where your data should live or where it should go, um, depending on a few things like the state of your cluster, or who's in, who's out. Uh, the, the Crush rules, the Crush map is called, uh, that you actually define, which allows you to say, I want, uh, you know, three copies of my data. I don't want any two copies to live on the same row in my data center. So it's actually to, uh, aware of your your topology, you know, your your you know data center, what it looks like. Um, and so it's you know, it's the nice thing about it is it's repeatable as deterministic. And so uh, you know, let's say I want to put some data into a cluster. Um, I will go and I'll figure out you know, talk to the monitors, who's in my monitor, or, or who's in my cluster, rather, and I'll be able to say, okay, this is the state of my cluster, here are my crush rules, um, here's the data, and it will push it in. And we can talk a little bit about um, how that placement happens in a minute, but uh, the nice thing about crush um, is it allows your data to 
uh, you, you don't have to move your data around a lot depending on the changes in the state of your cluster. Um, because it always kind of knows where it's supposed to live. Um, and this is another part of that intelligence of your object storage daemons. Um, let's say one of your OSDs goes down, um, and it knows that, that you know, all of the OSDs know that that one's out, um, and it knows how to rebalance your data, and so it doesn't have to move a whole lot of data around um, because crush changes, and it's going to know where it needs to move things. Um, so there's not a whole lot of data movement that needs to happen. So how does this work, right? So I want to push something into uh, my cluster. Um, and so I talk to uh, my monitors, and I found out the state of my cluster, and I take this object, whatever it is, and I split it up into uh, a number of placement groups, tunable, arbitrary placement groups. And so these individual placement groups uh, then get pushed into the cluster based on crush. Uh, and as you can see here, pretty color coding. Um, it goes and it looks at all of my OSDs. In this case, I have 10 OSDs. And it takes, uh, I think I set a replication level of two. And it takes two copies of each one of these and drops them on separate OSDs. So really, it's uh, at a little higher level. You're pushing your data uh, through Crush. The algorithm decides where it goes. You talk to, um, for each individual placement group then, you take that placement group and you push it into an OSD. That OSD will intelligently peer with what the crush algorithm says, the other uh, place your copy of your data should live, pushes it there for you, and then it returns and says, okay, you've successfully stored that placement group, move on to the next one. Uh, so what happens if something breaks? And this is what I was talking about. Let's, uh, this OSD here, uh, the one that's shaded out, it's hard to see. Let's say this red-yellow placement group uh, OSD decides to, to set on fire, alien invasion, something, uh, somebody decides to trip over a cord. Uh, it goes down, uh, and so your cluster is aware that that particular OSD has gone down. Uh, and then the two that are ca carrying the copies of that data say, hey, I've got the copy of the data. We need to get our replication back up to two copies of this data. Uh, so it automatically peers with where it's supposed to be now based on the new crush rules uh, and pushes it over to the, the OSDs where the data is supposed to live. Um, so let's revisit a bit of how we're talking to this cluster, right? We're talking to this, this object store. Uh, so there's really four different ways that you can talk to the object store. Um, the first being, obviously, Librados. Uh, this is our native way to talk to the object store. Um, has a lot of different features that you can, uh, that kind of define why it's cool. Um, but it's basically C, C++, <coughs> Python, Java, PHP, whatever. There's a number of different ways uh, that you can talk to it. Um, but this allows you to have atomic single action transactions. Um, it, you update your data, all the attributes together, and you push it straight into the object store. Um, this is for guys that are writing apps, right? I want to build something that talks to Ceph. Um, this is what I'm going to use to build it. Um, the next thing that you can use is the gateway. Um, and this is the other way to talk directly to your object store. It's just a, a little bit different way to do it. It's a RESTful gateway, so you can talk you know, over the HTTP protocol. Um, and we actually have instantiated both S3 and Swift APIs. So you can, if you have something that already uses S3 uh, as your endpoint or uses OpenStack Swift, um, if you have one of those things, um, you can spin up a, cluster, a Ceph cluster, uh, create uh, a, a Rados gateway or a number of load balance Rados gateways, um, change the endpoint, and no one will ever know the difference. Uh, and then there's the file system, uh, which I don't, didn't want to go into too deeply today because the CephFS is still a little wild westy. Um, it's not where the majority of our work has been focused on. Um, there's a lot of love that's coming in the near future, but uh, it's a POSIX compliant distributed file system um, that is based on your object, is based on the object store, right? So it allows you to have a distributed uh, file system that you can mount from a number of different places. Um, that is then backed by uh, this distributed object store, which gives you all kinds of really cool stuff, um, but is, is just not there yet. So that brings us to RBD, finally. Uh, the part that everyone came here to hear about. Um, so it's, like it says, a reliable and fully, be, fully distributed block device. Um, so there's Linux kernels, clients, QMU, KVM drivers, things like that, uh, native Linux driver. Uh, but basically, it's a thinly provisioned block device sitting on top of your object store. So what is it really? Um, Rados, the, the RBD gives you a, a number of features uh, that are pretty cool. Uh, 
It allows you to store disk images in Rados, really is what it comes down to. But it kind of allows you to decouple uh, the VM from the host because you have kind of this, uh, you know, distributed storage platform that you're, you're storing things on. Um, that's, so you have images, uh, VM images or, or disk images or whatever it is, um, that get striped across your entire cluster, split up into those placement groups that we were talking about. Um, this allows you to do some really cool things. Um, but with RBD, you have the ability then to do snapshots. And, and because it's a, a distributed uh, platform, you can do things like copy on write cloning and live migration. Um, and there's, you know, there's support in, as you can see, uh, QMU KVM. There's a mainline Linux kernel af after 2.6.39 um, where you can just mount it right out of Linux. Um, and then there's support for CloudStack, OpenStack, and then there's uh, Zen server stuff that's still being ironed out. So what does it look like? Um, this is what I was talking about. So you have some uh, disk that's mounted somewhere, as you can see, and then it's Britain broken up into a logical number of, of components and split across your uh, Ceph cluster. Um, and really the, the use case is for running VMs, right? And so that's kind of how it ends up looking. Uh, like when you have VMs running in CloudStack uh, and then you have the disks behind them, uh, they get split up across your Ceph cluster. Uh, and this, this does a number of really cool things for you, is if you have a extremely large disk um, or if you have a really, really busy disk, uh, it doesn't care because it's split across a number of different hosts, so it helps to <coughs> even out some of your hotspots and whatnot, uh, so that you, you don't really have to worry about that as much, because uh, Ceph is kind of has some, again, intelligence built into it to know, um, you know, even out those hotspots, basically. How are we doing on time? Ooh, running fast. So the idea, obviously, is that uh, all of those distributed objects, um, Liberados, puts all those objects together uh, into the block device. So then our L libRBD, excuse me, then puts those together uh, for a virtualization container and then the container exposes it to the VM. Um, the long and short of it is this allows you to have something that is essentially Amazon's elastic block store. Um, you get your own. Um, but because it's a shared environment, and this is what I was talking about before, is you can do really fun things like uh, migrating running instance between hosts, right? So you have that container, uh, and you decide you want to move it to a new host, but because it's backed by Ceph, uh, it, it doesn't care. You're not actually moving anything. Uh, you're just changing the logical front end, uh, and as long as you're still talking to Ceph, uh, the, the back end doesn't care. And then, yeah, the, the driver in the mainline Linux kernel allows you to map it as a native, you know, dev RBD0 or whatever. You can just mount it as a, as a normal device. So what's this copy on write cloning? Um, I'm surprised at the number of questions I get about copy on write cloning. Um, the, the best example, obviously, is I would make a golden image. Let's say I have a Ubuntu 1204 image uh, that I want to make available to my CloudStack instance. Uh, and I have, you know, usually it's not we're spinning up one copy. It's... Uh, I want to spin up 100 copies of this instance. Um, and so what this allows me to do is I spin up 100 copies of this instance, but I do it instantly, and I don't actually copy anything. I just use this golden image and I instantiate 100 copies of it, and it takes up zero additional storage. So now I have, in this case, four copies, uh, and it's taking up no additional storage. Uh, and so what that means is then each of these individual machines will be, you know, they'll boot up and, and whatever end user is control of that particular machine will start writing data to it. The only thing that you're going to have that's going to take up new storage now is the data that you're writing to it. Uh, and then when they go back and they want to read things from that particular instance, they will, if, it's, if there's something that's changed, they'll read it from their copy. Uh, if it hasn't changed, it'll just read straight through to the, the golden copy, if you will. And so that's copy on write cloning. Say that again? So can this lead to a performance problem because you have something like three replicas for the base image? Okay, so the question is, does this lead to performance issues because you have 100 copies that are reading from the same base image? And the, the answer really is no, because that base image is actually split into a huge number of placement groups across a wide number of machines. Uh, and so, I mean, as long as your network is relatively reliable and fast, uh, the answer is, is no, you shouldn't see. I mean. Eventually, you'll probably have to up your replication levels uh, so that there's more copies of that 
uh, of each of those placement groups to worry about, but, but essentially, no, not really. So this brings us to CloudStack, and wow, we're running really fast. Okay, um, so what does this mean for CloudStack? Um, so with, with CloudStack, so 4.0, um, the, the new 4.0 release, uh, got RBD support for primary storage uh, via KVM. So what does that mean? That means when you spin up a CloudStack, uh, if you were here during the last talk, uh, you'll, you'll know a lot about this, but if you spin up your CloudStack, um, you still need uh, the, a very small NFS uh, to, to serve those system VMs initially. But then after that, your primary storage uh, can be Ceph's RBD. Um, later versions are coming where you won't need that NFS. You'll be able to use Ceph for everything, but we're not quite there yet. Um, there's no support right now for VMware or Zen, um, and there's really no plan to. Um, the, the guy who, who wrote the integration, I'll get to him in a minute, uh, it, he's not from Ink Tank. He doesn't work directly for uh, for us, um, and he's not. He's doing it for a very specific use case. Um, there's no real plans to to build in support for for VMware and Zen. Um, patches are always welcome. <laughs> I would love to see someone else get really deeply involved uh, and and help Vito with a, a bit more of the building out of Ceph and CloudStack integration. Um, It's, it's the integration. When you said no support for VMware, it's actually, that, that's more of a hypervisor issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a lot, not here. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, the, so the, the live migration stuff that I was talking about is supported, but we, uh, we don't have, the, the cloud stack integration doesn't have the ability to do, to do snapshots from Ceph yet. Um, that one is coming, actually it's already written. Uh, we're just, Vito's just waiting for the, uh, the database back-end refactor for, that's coming in 4.2. Um, so yeah, that's, that's CloudStack now. Um, and the setup is actually really easy. Um, you spin up your CloudStack instance, uh, and then you just, you go to your, whether it's the UI or whether you're doing the, the CloudMonkey stuff or, or any of the various CLI uh, stuff, you just, you add it as a primary storage. Um, there's a, uh, a protocol selection, you just do RBD and you uh, point it at the particular place where your, um, you know, your monitor or whatever it is that you want to plug into, um, uh, and then you fill in your authentication info for CephX, um, maybe tag it as RBD so you can do some stuff later. But there's, there's really nothing special about it. Uh, as long as you can spin up CloudStack and you can spin up Ceph, it's really easy to plug the two of them together. So what's next? Um, the snapshot and the, the backup support uh, is probably going to be able to come in in 4.2. Um, with that, that new storage code refactor stuff that's coming in uh, with 4.2. Um, most of the underlying stuff is already written, so it's just managing or, or a matter of making sure that uh, how they did the new storage stuff doesn't break anything. Um, cloning, or, or if you're European, I was informed that that, that is actually called layering uh, support, so the, the, the copy and write clone stuff that I was talking about, um, that's also going to be coming uh, in the future, probably, well, maybe with 4.1, but probably with 4.2. Uh, and then Ceph support for being able to be a, a secondary storage so that uh, the, the storage of your images themselves, the image catalog, um, and for backup storage. Uh, backup storage is new with 4.2, I guess. I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but the secondary storage also will be coming with 4.2. Um, and that's actually a great use case for that, uh, for that gateway. Um, for your backup storage stuff. So who's to blame? Uh, the guy who actually wrote the integration, his name is Vito Denhollander. Um, he's one of our partners in Europe, and we actually like it this way. Where, where we're not writing all the integrations, we would much rather see the community uh, not only write them, but own those integrations. We're happy to help with whatever um, people are interested in doing or building, uh, but we would much prefer that it's not all centrally located. Uh, you know, if our LA office is, uh, you know, if the, the big one hits, and uh, our LA team gets swept out into the ocean, we want to make sure that, uh, that the distributed knowledge is there. Um, but if you have questions on the integration between CloudStack and Ceph, this is the guy to ask. Uh, he hangs out in our IRC channel, so if you want to come to our IRC channel, we're on OFTC.net uh, at hash Ceph. Um, you can hit his website, 42on.com. If you're a, a European dude um, or chick uh, and you want to talk about CloudStack and Ceph, he has a they're 42 on the company. That's what they do. They spin up CloudStack and Ceph. Um, 
That's Vito, yeah. Um, and but you know we we work in in Europe and yes. we kind of throw stuff over the wall to each other. But uh, but yeah, he's the guy who wrote the integration. Uh, he is actively working on it, and I know he would welcome uh, help or patches uh, if you wanted to do uh, anything that that he isn't currently doing. So that's the gist. Um, I busted through that pretty quick. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah, far away. So talking about the object store. Um, Yesterday we had um, an interesting line of discussion around number of objects really needed to, to be a massive scale object store. What's the largest production deployment as far as number of objects in your object store? Oh, the number of objects, not the size of the cluster? Right. Um, and, and you can tell me magnitude rather than you know, down to in number of objects. Yeah. Uh, well, I know the, the largest cluster that we currently have as a customer, a support customer, is the DreamHost cluster. Um, th those guys did the, the Dream Objects and um, check it out. It's, it's probably, it was the first and it was the, it's currently the largest supported production cluster. But that being said, I was actually just talking to somebody the other day who spun up a Ceph cluster on their own um, who was not associated with us and we didn't even know they were running Ceph until uh, a random conversation happened but they have an object store that was running um, in the high three-digit millions in terms of numbers of objects um, and you know they're, they're working on various ways of, of manipulating that and some performance things that they wanted to tune uh, which is why they started talking to us but uh, I can't give any specifics but yeah there's huge numbers of, of object that are out there, but also large, clus uh, large clusters that are out there. So, does that answer your question? Well, I suppose I'm going to get without getting a number yeah. of, uh, of objects. So yeah. 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 So the discussion yesterday was about the HDFS pack, you know, object storage, current capabilities are around 100 to 200, without solving some problems that need to be solved. This is to make it back for. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's what Dream Object is. It's a competitor for S3. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But there, there's uh, issues of scale. I mean, think of when you think of the number of objects in S3, that tends to be magnitudes of where anyone else is. And yeah. Yeah. That's at that point, uh, it's just a question of your uh, cluster implementation, right? Because that gateway that's providing the ability to do that S3 stuff. Um, you can spin up as many gateway machines as you want to and load balance them how you want to. Um, the actual number of objects within Ceph itself uh, is, I, I hate to use the word, but it's essentially infinite, right? Uh, depend, you just have to scale out more machines, more disks, more, more OSDs uh, sure. to be able to accomplish you that. You keep running into different constraints, right? Um, it, it's not perfectly infinite. Um, I mean, theoretically, HDFS is perfectly open. Right. Well, uh, in, in reality, the until they hit the, the single node lookups problems you know, with it. With you know, actually, I think HDFS has a more explicit limit than the set that I know of because they have a, today, in the current generation, without, you know, without generation, you have a name node. Everything has to fit in there. That's what you have to Yeah, that's where I was just going with that, yeah. I don't think there's, a, there's a actually a limitation like that with set. There's probably, not a, there's probably not an explicit one, but there's probably a real world limit that you're going to hit some constraint at some point. Yeah, the, the first constraint that you're going to hit with Ceph is network. Um, so I mean, if you can, if you could, in theory, throw infinite NICs and, and infinite, you know, various network connections at it, uh, you could, could scale it to infinity, but obviously that's going to be the first place where people are showing that it's bounded is by network traffic because there is a lot of that intercluster uh, communication that really, it's fairly chatty. and and, and Actually, as a, an aside, um, if you're spinning up OSDs, in terms of the actual data storage on the OSD, we recommend that you don't use SSDs for that. Uh, the, the best performance and, and longevity that we're seeing is using spinning Rust for the actual data and then journaling for that OSD on, a, on an SSD because you can split them apart. Um, but because it's so chatty and there's so, so many reads and writes, we're actually finding that with a, a significantly large and high traffic cluster that we're burning out OSDs at a prodigious rate. 
um, if you use them for all of your data storage. But if, if, if you don't really recommend uh, SSD, how do you support like really high ops, high IOPS kind of information? That's, uh, that's a much longer question or an answer than I probably have time to answer. Um, and the guy to talk to about that actually is Mark Nelson. He's our uh, performance guy. He does all things performance. And he's done a number of really nice, lengthy blog entries on the Ceph blog. Uh, but if you'd like to know more specifically, hit me afterwards. I'll put you in touch with Mark, and he can give you the brain dump of all brain dumps. Yeah? Uh, is there any thought to uh, kind of quality service uh, in the block store? Like, I want to guarantee this block gets 400 IOFs a second, but not first team to 10,000. Um, there isn't, as far as I know, there isn't any explicit work being done on costs um, in terms of something like that. Um, I know that there are a number of. Uh, so in, in a large scale deployment, how do you prevent you know, one guy from using 80% of your network uh, I don't know the explicit answer to that. I, I have an idea, but I don't want to talk out of my nether regions. Um, shoot me an email. Okay. I'll, I'll get you the right answer. So there's not a lot in open source that does deal with the noisy neighbor problem. The closest that I know of open source is Sheepbell, which will try and put um, the disk on the same machine as uh, the hypervisor, so that that's local. That's, that's not a great solution. Uh, SolidFire is trying to do a lot of work around yeah, QoS, but uh, that's not well, that's necessarily, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, the, the sh short answer is that there are some things that you can do with Ceph uh, where you can tell it how to handle particular data or requests or, or kind of where those things are supposed to live and how they're supposed to get there, but there's no real answer to QOS right now is the short answer. Any other questions? Say it again. <coughs> Oh, what, what's the latency for when uh, an OSD fails? In terms of in terms of what the recovery of the data before you reach full replication? Um, that is another one of those. I'm going to add an asterisk to the answer, um, but that that's highly dependent on uh, things like your network. Um, the actual size of your placement groups is tunable. Uh, I think the the mm, I'm not sure what the minimum placement group size is off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, you can you can tune that to be based on your particular network infrastructure uh, to speed that up. Uh, and I'm it has to go to the monitor no, no. The the OSDs will are, are aware of who's in and who's out because there's multiple monitors and they're they're talking to each other all the time. And if it hits a timeout and it can't talk to a particular OSD after a certain amount of time, also configurable, um, it'll say this OSD is down. Uh, it'll mark it as down, and then it will start migrating data. Um, so yeah, it's it's all configurable, and that's that's actually why we invent we we created Ink Tank, the company. Uh, Ceph is incredibly powerful, but with you know a huge amount of any system power, uh, there's also means there's tons and tons of tunables and configurables and stuff like that. And so we were getting so many questions about, hey, come in and tune my cluster. Uh, that, that's why we finally made the decision to say we need a company to do that. Um, so yeah, it's highly predicated on what your particular infrastructure build is, um, but the answer is it, it can be as, as good as you need it to be, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, what's in Bobtail? Uh, so, so the question is, can you have two different networks, one for control messages and one for the actual data path? Um, all right, I, I don't want to say yes because I don't know for sure. Um, I, I like Steve's talk about how it's, you know, the, the guy teaching is not necessarily the guy with all the answers and I'm 
far from the guy with all the answers. Um, shoot me an email. I'll get you the right answer. Any other questions? All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank Early lunch. <laughs>